Welcome back to the Possibility War. It is August 1st, 2020 as we're playing, even though in our game we are back to late spring of 2017. I like to keep the war in the game's originating year, at least for the first year, and for Torg Eternity that was 2017. To interject, this video and potentially the next will be highlight videos because, again, the sound quality turned out to be pretty bad. This time it was a quirk of OBS where an update was downloaded and all settings were reset. I now check those settings prior to every recording we make. Now, on to the game. Ginger asked for the mission briefing to be gone over again. Quinn Sebastian had basically told you all that uh, a, a scientist from the Nile Empire had spoken with a spy from the Delphi Council uh, in Cairo and had given up some information. He was, he was drinking at the time. And so he gave a bunch of information about a, a weird science digging device and the fact that he and his boss, Professor Omar Sharif, uh, were going to uh, the living land to exchange some uh, World War One style firearms for a uh, for a wonder of some type that was uh, found in Barkaz uh, zone. So. Basically what happened is um, all of you went into the living land, which you had already been doing for a couple of months, and uh, you were trying to, to run some things around, but in this particular instance, you were told to go to a particular location that uh, Herr Dr. Uh, Heinrich Marlin had told you uh, was necessary to go to. That's where the digging device was going to go. And uh, you wound up getting into a fight with a pair of Gotax, uh, a Dinos Gotax and some warriors and Gosbog that were actually hunting to do a different kind of mission but since you guys got captured you didn't have the opportunity to really complete that part of your mission uh, it was more story based than anything else I'll go ahead and let you know that you got captured and you were being taken towards a particular camp when the Gotax heard gunfire which is highly unusual in the living land and they went to investigate it on getting to the location where they were at they noticed that many of their brethren um, were lying dead on the ground and uh, they decided to react uh, with extraordinary anger because that's what a Dinos do. They don't, they don't have the social axiom to be able to understand the difference between calm and anger. To them it's all anger. Okay. Um, okay. So there are some out there, <clears throat> Mo, uh, who who might understand that a little bit better. Now, uh, they basically left you guys behind. They had not bound your hands or anything. They had not taken your what your dead things, your weapons, and they decided to take off after all of these other bad guys, these bigger targets who were taking down their, their uh, brother and sister Adinos, who were also Red Jaws. Uh, the Red Jaw clan is uh, a bad guy clan, if you will, uh, within the living land, although they consider themselves supporters and followers of Baraka, the High Lord of the living land. Um, so you found the digging device, you were able to get free of your captors, um, you managed to help them take down quite a few of the Nile Empire uh, bad guys that were there and you got into the digging device okay um, once you cleared out the the remainder of the living land forces that were within the digging device uh, you were able to take control of it you closed up the the cargo doors you made sure that the hatch was dogged in place like it was supposed to be and unfortunately during the period that the um, uh, that you were trying to clear the forces Nile forces out of the digging device so that you could you could do something with it, uh, one of them, a Nile sergeant, decided to put a few holes into the the control panels at the at the far end of the digging device in the third trolley, and that caused an, an automatic countdown. Well. Also during that time, I guess I'm giving the whole thing. So also during that time, uh, Peaches 
uh, and well, all of you understood that, except for uh, except for Saban, all of you understood that uh, Mo had somehow disappeared. So you finished cleaning out the digging device. Peaches went out to try and find Mo to get him inside before the timer expired, and instead found his crushed and, and cut in half body uh, underneath a giant black obelisk. Okay, or not obelisk, a, uh, well, I guess it's a three dimensional rectangle. We'll just call it that. Um, uh, in case none of you got the reference, I was trying to use the stone tablet from 2001 A Space Odyssey. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, <laughs> I wouldn't do that if I were you, Dave. Anyway, uh, so the, the, the Adenos scout that Mo had been chasing had also been killed, but he had been carrying this wonder, um, which, uh, which was out there, which was a, a glass and wood encased gold and silver and bejeweled egg. Okay, so uh, sorry, Peach just picked that up, took it back to the to the digging device, managed to close everything up in time for the digging device to begin returning to the Nile Empire. Um, after a great deal of searching, uh, in which you really didn't find anything else. Um, so now we're at a point where um, you're coming to the to the end of day three of your travels, but it's actually uh, closer to midday where you are. So I'm going to read this to kind of uh, get you all into the uh, into the scene, and we'll we'll get cards out and stuff in a few minutes. The motions and vibrations of the incredible weird science digging device grinding through the earth for the past three days, obviously moving very rapidly, seem to have finally settled into your bones. Though there was some cause for what might otherwise be termed seasickness, you seem to gather your legs just as the machine lurches to a jarring halt. Unfortunately, some of you are surprised and end up taking an involuntary seat. For Thuban, he ends up taking an involuntary wall. <laughs> The machine has reached its port of call. Undogging the side hatch of the digging device, you find it comes open with remarkable ease, revealing a massive cave, partially natural and partially built with concrete walls and floor. You step over the space between the exterior hatch footer, hood footer and the platform on solid ground again. Looking around, you see everything is decorated in a mid-30s art deco style. <clears throat> Straight away from the hatch, no more than 20 feet distant, is a richly appointed corridor, a beautiful stained glass deco light above and between the twin arches, though presently dark, revealing a shadowed staircase. It's, it's dark, but you can see just enough light beyond to, to uh, catch that there is a, a staircase, winding counterclockwise upwards and out of sight. To the left and right of the arched opening are banks of weird science devices reminiscent of those on the digging device, arcing and flashing in the same way as the dial switches, pulleys, and levers there. Exiting the digger, you find the massive screw at each end of the strange vehicle are well within the confines of this garage station as a large and heavy rivet-covered door rolls closed behind it. Like it or not, you're here. The only question is, where is here? Now. Can I, may I please have a um, find roll from uh, Chris, Peaches, and Saban? So let's see, 16. 17, 16. Okay, um, Penny manages to find a glass enclosure that seems to have a human hand that was cut off and goes, ooh, pretty. While the, the other two of you, <laughs> while Thuban and Chris, notice a slight click towards, uh, towards the end opposite the heavy riveted door. And you notice that the, um, the entirety of the the digging device was not yet rested, so it rolls back about an inch, and the click is a giant red button that has just uh, released. Lively discussion ensued concerning the now depressed big red button between Chris and Thuban, who then mentioned a desire to reanimate the hand hidden behind glass. 
The platform you now stand on extends the length of the room beyond the length of the entirety of the digging device, but not by much. At the end, to your left, which is opposite the big riveted door, is a door to a lavatory, a most welcome sight just now for at least those of you who use the bathroom like normal folks. Um, to the right of that door, on that same wall, you see another uh, door for an office with leaded glass inset labeled Hair Doctor Heinrich Marlin. To your right is a solid concrete wall with over a dozen gauges and pressure valves inset. Several minutes pass as you look around the room at the various devices and, once you've agreed, there is nothing of tactical use here, and there is not. Trust me. Um, and nothing about the purpose of the trip into the living land or about the Fabergé egg you managed to acquire in the digging device, the stairs circling up are the next logical place to go. Though as you approach, uh, though as any of you may approach the double entry, you hear footfalls of at least two people coming down the stairs. With Chris's admonition to hide, Ginger agreed and, and they found places easily. Requesting stealth checks for all, Peaches and Thuban made it well enough, though Chris needed to try and throw something at the roll, reminding me that because we had just entered the second act of the adventure, I needed to get cards out for my friends. Then I remembered that in the Nile Empire, players each get five destiny cards rather than the normal four. Next, I had to get my friends arranged on the turn order app for roll 20. Cards distributed, everybody on the turn, turn order, uh, everything in its proper place. I then asked. For Chris, do you did you get any cards just now? We're not in combat, but did you get any cards just now that might help you? Chris then threw down an adrenaline to make his roll, succeeding at stealth. That's 11 right there. You're good to go. Uh, so, all of you hide, and pretty soon... Uh, Oh, hang on. Pretty soon, you see two young men. One of them is dressed in a, a desert brown, so basically a sandy-colored Egyptian uniform. Okay, he, he is not dressed as a shock trooper, but he's dressed as in, in an Egyptian uniform. And then there's another one who is there in a, in a lab coat. The one in the lab coat calls out... Hey, Dr. Marlin, where are you? Hey, get the lights. And the uh, the one dressed in the Egyptian uniform uh, tries to start hunting around for a light switch and finds it pretty quickly. Now, the three of you are hidden well enough. Um, actually, Thuban, probably the best place for you to go is either... Under the the screw at the end where Dr. Marlin's office is, or even into Dr. Marlin's office, uh, well, maybe not. And then for Peaches and Chris, um, you guys can find various places to hide behind because there are stands with all kinds of experiments and stuff on them. Chris then asked about why Thuban couldn't hide on the ceiling, for which the band's player Josh and I attempted to explain something about Stallinger anatomy. Then, Robert's request to find out where his created zombie was hiding brought a bright spark of my, to my day, as I had to explain where it was, using it for just a minute. The zombie, um, you didn't say exactly where the zombie was, so I'm going to use him for a second. Um, he, is still, he is still standing in the hatchway of, uh, of the digging device, and when he sees Carl and Khufu, he goes and starts moving forward. Yeah, he, he does not fall down between the, between the platform and the train because there's only about two inches of, of space there. So he can step right over. Josh then asked if Carl and Khufu had seen it yet. Yes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> this is wonderful. Okay, um... It, <laughs> both of them as a matter of fact let me um let's see carl uh let's see carl freaks the fuck out and then khufu khufu does a little bit better but not much both of them are very stymied 
right now um, if I had characters for them. But they they both just kind of stand there and go... <gasps> Ginger then suggested capturing and binding them up before either could come to their senses, both Peaches and Thuban charging from their hiding spots to accomplish this. Thuban was to take the lab assistant, whom it called a wizard, leaving Penny to take care of Khufu. I requested an armed combat test, for which Thuban and Penny both failed. But Josh decided to throw a hero card, and Penny put in a possibility... Otherwise, she would have suffered a four-case disconnect. Okay, the two of you managed to subdue both of these uh, uh, young men, okay, um, with nary a squeak, because uh, Thuban got a 14, which was uh, four above what he needed, and or I'm sorry, five above what he needed, and then Peaches... Uh, uh, rolled very much higher. So uh, that's what, seven, eight by eight. So you get a hold of these two guys and there are, what what you've got is a parlor. Okay, there's a parlor there. And there's a nice little table and there's a few chairs and a couple of little divans, or not divans, uh, what do you call those? The, the short couches. Um, there are plenty of places to tie these guys down and you guys have plenty of rope to do it with. The debate over where to tie Carl and Khufu began with Thuban suggesting a pair of tables nearby, though its senses were likely not detecting everything. Actually, what, what Thuban senses is more than what Chris and Peaches sense because you sense that it's made out of wood and it's lighter wood. It's probably not going to hold anything in place. Thuban told them that the table legs would not be strong enough, which brought Peaches to the suggestion of using two of the more sturdy couches, but Chris countered by asking about using pipes or poles or the radiator. As a matter of fact, uh, there does happen to be a pair of radiators down here because you are, uh, you are, what, probably 15 meters below ground? Um, yeah. It's going to be, yeah, just a little bit chilly. So, yeah, there are a couple of radiators there, um, old-timey radiators, that are very strong. Both set sturdily to the walls, but you'll notice that the floor, uh, that and not just the floor, but, but your environment is pretty warm. So if you, if you are looking to not damage these guys, then you might not want to tie them to the radiators because the radiators are giving off quite a bit of heat. As a matter of fact, Thuban, you would, you would actually feel the heat from where you're at. Thuban asked if they needed to be kept alive, pointing out they would be easier to talk to if they were not indeed burned alive. When I pointed out there were still two couches and two chairs in the room, Ginger asking if other places existed outside this room to tie them up, I responded in the affirmative to having plenty of places in the lab area or even within the digging device. Eventually, though, they settled on the couches in the lounge area as it would be harder for the Nile men to move if they were bound ankles and wrists there. Peaches then asked if her training as a firefighter would allow her to make good knots to hold them in place. Yeah, some some of your training would require you to to uh, be able to use ropes effectively. So yeah, we're, we're going to say that you get them tied down. Now what? Thuban, understanding Peaches and Chris may want to interrogate their prisoners, suggested its appearance was frightening enough before I interrupted him. You say that... Just as your zombie goes wandering by uh, in answer to your your frightening uh, comment and, <laughs> and heads toward the couch with the white-coated individual. Thuban ordered his zombie to stay back while Ginger explained it would be rude to eat him, especially when they needed to question these guys. Thuban then volunteered to be the muscle, though he didn't want to be the interrogator because of what the Isle Axiom Wash had done to his head. Now, for, for Peaches and Chris, you remember that Axioms were mentioned in the briefing material that you got from the, the uh, um, obelisk in Manhattan on the day of the invasion. So when he says Axiom Wash... 
Acknowledging understanding of the term axiom wash, Ginger sought to clarify Thuban's origin, which had been, of course, the living land, though he now much preferred Isle. Thuban then covered his moment of crisis, where he encountered an undead monster and made it, quote-unquote, go away. Discussion between Thuban and Penny allowed them to sort out the role of the interrogator, good cop versus bad cop, in using persuasion or intimidation, though Chris was not left out. Penny asking for his help as an interrogator as well, though only his persuasion had any ads in it. Then Thuban began expounding upon his negative six penalty as an outsider, to which I countered. Now with intimidation, if if you go to do the intimidation, Thuban, you're actually going to have a bonus because neither of these guys has been out of Egypt before, let alone seen anybody from the living land. So... <laughs> Thuban expressed that were he human, he would have an ear-to-ear -ear grin on his face, while Penny suggested he could intimidate them best by telling them he was hungry and they looked delicious. When asked what he was going to do with the zombie, Thuban po appointed him to be worse, worse cop, quote-unquote, that it would be their fate if they didn't cooperate. Much laughter started over this idea. So it takes just a few minutes for for them to actually uh you guys didn't actually say you were knocking them out so you but you did manage to get them subdued um to a point where maybe they were a little bit confused so it only takes a minute or two for them to come out of their confusion uh more or less and uh uh the band which, go ahead you're, you're staring at who both Peaches and Thuban, on Carl's waking, were both staring him down, Peaches' fire axe in hand, threatening him that they could end the conversation quickly if he had nothing to say. Then Thuban added, likely looking at Penny as though Carl couldn't hear them, that even if Peaches did kill him, the Stallinger could still make his soul talk forever. The, uh, the guy in the white lab coat, uh, uh, on his lab coat, it's kind of embroidered the name Carl. Um, he pisses himself. Just plain straight. I'm not even going to make you guys roll. He, he looks at you, Thaban, and he kind of catches a glimpse of, of Penny standing in the, in the you know, uh, you know, near, nearby and with the ax and he just pisses himself and starts to whimper. Getting down on eye level with the whimpering Carl, one that has just pissed himself. Ginger asked his name and attempted to calm him down a little bit, then asked him where they were and what was going on. He he nods rapidly, and then he says, y You're at al Kunfada. You're in the Nile Empire. She continued asking other questions of the reluctantly compliant Carl, receiving answers as rapidly as he could get them out. Thuban then asked about Professor Sharif. He and Peaches playing about humans Thuban had eaten, and he wasn't certain how many they all looked alike, and all for the sake of continuing the threat in their captives' minds. And then Thuban pushed, My dear boy, there are so many worse things I could do than eat you. To further make his case, he used a tentacle to point at the zombie, still wearing the shock trooper skirt. He, he kind of looks past you. <laughs> and the other and uh, suddenly you hear an Egyptian, which Peaches understands outright, but is also translated by the device on Chris's wrist. Um, uh, oh, shut up, you fool. And it's the it's uh, Khufu standing uh, or still strapped to the uh, to the uh, divan. Khufu waking up warned Carl to shut up in Egyptian, though the translator from Ukon let everyone hear it in their native languages anyway. Chris, in an effort to shut the officer up and distract him, used telekinesis to tickle the back of the man's neck, with what it took a bit of time to figure out. As that search continued, Thuban now spoke to Khufu about his potential fate. Being military, however, the Egyptian military officer answered in perfect English with resistance. His threats then turned to the subject of possibility, energy, and if he knew anything about it. Khufu asked why they were tied up, to which 
Peaches answered, quote unquote, It's to give you an opportunity to be humble while we decide what to do with you. Thuban then pointed to the zombie, Khufu asking in surprise, You made him? Even as impressed as he appeared to be, however, he put up a good front. Claiming ignorance, his young, idealistic patriotism coming to the fore with his age. Then, Chris turned back to finding something to distract Khufu with. You know, um, there are probably some small pebbles around. Um, as a matter of fact, thank you very much. There are quite a few pebbles that you can find at the base of the stairs, but they go into... And kind of all over the room. I mean, there's there's only probably about 10 or 20 pebbles in there if you were to stop and actually count them. But there are pebbles throughout the room. So sure, you could use a pebble um, to do that if you want to. Because of the perceived difficulty of getting information from either prisoner, Thuban decided to curse Carl as Chris used his telekinesis to tickle the back of Khufu's neck with one or more of the pebbles to give him a moment of pause, for which I then worked to convince him the Egyptian was likely to be freaked out enough. Stop for just a second, if you will, and consider the following. He has a magnificently huge floating starfish um, floating about a meter or two above him. He's got a... a, 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 a a Mexican-American chick with a big, nasty axe and a zombie in the room. Are you thinking you're really going to freak him out any more with that little pebble? Thuban mentioned he'd not had lunch yet, and hilarity ensued about placing orders for lunch. Meant, of course, to shake up Carl and Khufu. All right, you're not supposed to be throwing too many suggestions at one another, but I'll let that one stand. Um, he he goes to try and move his arms and his body so that he can itch, and finally he scoots up just enough to where the ropes are really tight around him, but he can at least move his neck on the back of the, the chair. I hate spiders. The band questions Carl about the digging device. Oh, well, he, he can't see. Well, he's seen the digging device before, so he's got an idea of what you're pointing at. But it, it doesn't really seem to phase him all that much. So, uh, now, Curse, uh, Curse does what? It. Uh... Josh explained that Curse is a miracle that diminishes a foe's luck by applying a minus one penalty or greater, depending on the level of success for um, a target versus their faith or spirit. All right, go ahead and, and, and see what you get. Okay. Um, let's see. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's not feeling quite as confident as he was, um, and he does finish itching his, in the back of his neck. Thuban then asked about the feeling on the back of Khufu's neck, explaining he had done that, and it was only an example of the terrible things he could do, and then asked to no one in particular what he should do next, with the intent to continue escalating pain and issues for the soldier until he cracked. He explained he was going to ask questions, and each time Khufu didn't answer, his lot would become worse. Then Peaches began into the questions. For one, who Carl and Khufu worked for, if they knew anything about the exchange that was supposed to take place in the living land, and gaining truthful answers from them, neither knew about the exchange. Ginger then asked about Hildy Marlin, Carl having a thing for her, obviously, finding out she was at a local market shopping for food for the week. Finally, they got down to questions about the base, such as how many folks were on uh, the base, to which Khufu had a bad reaction when Carl told the truth. Thuban rebuked Carl, telling him to not shut up, because his coming close uh, to because he was coming close to his chance to live. Penny threatens Khufu with a gag if he doesn't cooperate, while Thuban tells him he's a very, very bad friend, and they would hate to damage him permanently. Then, asking a simple question of Khufu, what day he thought it was, the officer swore he would not answer, at which time Thuban cast doom on him. 
which would make him stymied and vulnerable and ta uh, you know and with an outstanding success his next role was going to be disfavored finally khufu answered earning a good tentacle pat on the head from the stallinger Peaches asked Chris, the engineer, to look around and see if anything else of relevance was yet to be discovered, and he could not find anything. Chris then wanted to ensure all doors that could be locked are, and since only two doors in this structure, 15 meters below ground existed, he moved on to the next thing he noticed. The stairs going up to Dr. Marlin's basement, four stories above. Thuban then asked, in general, if any other questions could be asked, uh, of their bound, quote-unquote, friends. Chris then asked Carl how many of the Nile troops there were, who explained. I, I don't know. I don't pay attention to details like that. I know that there are some tower guards and there are some... Um, uh, there are some vehicles up there, and and uh, there were vehicles, so I, I know that, and I, I, I know there's a, a big uh, troop transport or two up there. Uh, oh, and and, uh, and there's a and at this point, Khufu uh, turns and whips his head around again, and he's oh, oh. <laughs> and Carl takes note. Peaches asked the band to sick his zombie on Khufu if he spoke again, as Carl continued. And and there's a there's a seaplane in the hangar on the other side of the base, and a seaplane. And then, um, and then Peaches asks her question, guard towers, and Carl is like, yeah, we, we've got a few guard towers. Uh, it's, it's a secret military base. You're not supposed to be here. Thuban explained, while laughing, we're not supposed to do a lot of things. Then Peaches asked, a secret base? To which Carl became smart with her, asking where else she would find an incredible digging device like Dr. Marlin's. And then... Not falling for his snide comment, she asked how it became a secret base. Built around this house and the incredible digging device that Dr. Marlin put together, um, but they, they turned it into a military base around this house. I, I don't know anything other than that. I was told to keep my eyes and my mouth shut. Peaches then asked Carl what his job was, to which he answered to being Marlin's assistant. But then Carl became fearful, demanding to know where his mentor was. Peaches then lied to him, gave him the sad news of Marlin's death only at the tentacles of Thuban, rather than as a skewer for the Edinos back in the Living Land. And Carl... Carl... <laughs> <laughs> Carl looks at Thuban. He's like, no, no, and he passes out. Thuban then remarked out loud how they were just preparing to let Carl go, and what a shame it was they wouldn't be able to, because he had passed out. Afterwards, the blood drained from Carl's face, leaving Peaches as a medic to figure out what was wrong with him, apart from urinating himself dehydrated. She determined he was in shock and moved to treat him, after Thuban covered him up with a blanket. Then, Thuban, continuing his attempts to keep Khufu in line through veiled, creepy-ass threats, explained they would continue the questioning later. Now, it was time to move the story along. The knights weren't entirely certain where to go, though they were presented with the option to ascend the stairs. Thuban tried to decide if it should cast disguise on itself to look more human while Chris returned from looking throughout Marlin's cave. I continued to give hints about the stairwell, ranging from veiled to subtle to putting it directly in the players' faces, but their reluctance did not go unnoticed. So, you gain the physical appearance of another, and you can keep that up as long as you concentrate. Peaches found Thuban's disguise spell to be quote-unquote cool. They continued to speak and joke about the differences and needs between the living and the dead, including reasons behind why Thuban felt he needed to disguise himself. Ginger then explained Peaches intended to somehow lock Carl and Khufu in the room before they would start to travel upstairs. Thuban added his desire to really keep the Nile agents locked in by erecting magical barriers of earth. The overall goal was to keep them from bolting from the room and tripping some sort of alarm. 
the Knights spent the next few minutes way overthinking how to keep Carl and Khufu in. Peaches really, really wanted to keep the Nile agents from escaping by any means possible. Finally, they... Okay, well, you start upstairs. Ascending the circular stair, you find yourself soon in a concrete basement. The timbers along the ceiling indicating this is not a military structure, but a house. You find an ancient water heater and a massive wood stove with pipes leading into the house above, and a couple of pipes, uh, well, no, you don't need pipes below, and nary an item of weird science anywhere else. A set of basic tools, hammers, chisels, screwdrivers, and other hand tools take up a 12-foot space on a pegboard along the wall leading to the stairs up into the kitchen. Uh, do you guys go into the kitchen, or do you stay down in the, in the basement for a minute? The knights decided to move up into the kitchen, above the basement, and above the secret lab. Seeking first whether or not anyone was up there, then deciding to invade the space, creaky floors and all. Thuban, despite his excellent role to disguise itself... You've got some difficulty kind of maneuvering through the, the man-sized doors, especially since the doors in the, in the, uh, up until about 1955 were only built about half wide. Josh decided Thuban would turn sideways to fit through. And you still have to squeeze through. So, <laughs> remember, you're a meter thick. Um, let's see. Though the curtains are drawn, a sufficient amount of daylight makes its way into the house for you to see. Unfortunately, the nail lane floors at your feet tend to creak loudly. Doing, uh, doing all you can to be stealthy, you explore the remainder of the house, finding the lab assistant's bedroom, Dr. Marlin's room, and a room appointed more for a younger woman. In her room, you find a diary for one Hildegard or Hildy Marlin, uh, which, if read, reveals nothing about anything other than the life of an innocent young woman, one from the 1930s. On the first floor, you find another large room toward the back of the house, well furnished and with uniforms and swords from various campaigns hanging along the walls. This room is not messy, though there are some items out of place, a week's worth of desert dust having accumulated on many surfaces. Surely this was Sharif's room, though you might ask why would he be living with Dr. Marlin and Hildy? Finally, anyone opening a curtain, even to peek through, to look outside will quickly want to close them, lest you be seen by a patrol of Nile shock troops passing by outside Dr. Marlin's home. Fortunately, this house is more in one corner of the base and on a hill roughly four meters above the rest of it, granting a fair view to the remainder of the structures with little chance of revealing your location apart from uh, the patrolled walk up the hill to the gate in front of the Marlins' home. You also see, um, beyond some other buildings on the lower ground, you see that you are on the, the sandy beach of a sea somewhere. And you see water going out uh, a long distance, all the way to the horizon. Peach is asked about seeing an airplane. Um, you see a hangar all the way across the base. There are no buildings here that are more than one story, uh, except for Dr. Marlin's house. Okay. Um, two layers of barbed wire fences, guard towers all around the fence, kennels with guard dogs in them, and more dogs wandering between the two security fences, a motor pool, generator room, uh, the seaplane hangar with a canal leading out into the sea, and uh, a warehouse are the features of this base. Um, one might imagine there are several dozen officers, soldiers, dogs, and civilian workers wandering about, and more inside the buildings. Now, how did Mobius plan to get out to Christmas Island again? Sharif's journal beckons. Peaches correctly identified the seaplane as the answer to that question. The Then she equivocated about whether it would be by ship or not, being uncertain. However, she did identify the urgency of their mission, wanting to get, quote-unquote, out there first to keep Mobius from succeeding. Thuban agreed, stating that dying from a lack of quote-unquote P energy would be bad. Then Josh recognized calling it P energy just did not sound right. It would be possibilities or nothing from that point. I was able to continue my description then. Uh, so, it is still broad daylight out there. Uh, and you do see 
a, a, a series of troops wandering around uh, on the roads of the base, but you only count um, probably a total of nine people that you see all together. The base itself is covered in, in sand, and you can tell the sand that it's on was probably shipped in because it's a different color than the seashore. Um, let's see what else. You do see some trucks. You do see some some war vehicles, if you will. Peaches sought clarity there about dogs. You see uh, a, f a total of, if you wait long enough, you'll see a total of four dogs with handlers at relatively even intervals wandering around uh, between the two security fences. And there are places, there are several places for them to get out if they need to. A decision against wandering around in broad daylight was quick and unanimous. Peaches then asked about resources to disguise everyone, not readily able to find any particular source. Now, uh, in Sharif's room, he actually has a long white scarf that uh, uh, airplane pilots from World War I and World War II have used uh, a lot. But that's it. Taking the scarf, Peaches attempted to turn Chris into an auxiliary pilot, to which Chris cautiously agreed. You three kind of work on a plan for a few minutes. Peaches began by stating the obvious about grabbing the plane and heading to Christmas Island, to which Thuban pointed out the potential difficulty of getting to the hangar. Peaches complimented Thuban on his disguise, asking if he could disguise all of them, to which he responded he could try, but would need to know what they wanted to look like. She then asked if there was a photo of Hildy Marlin nearby. Oh yeah, yeah, there are uh, all kinds of photos from little girl photos up to, uh, she, you would guess that she's probably 18 or 19 years old at this point. And all of the photos, of course, are in black and white. Thuban joked about disguising Chris as the daughter and Peaches as the scientist, to which all laughed before Ginger described the differences between her character and what Hildy Marlin would look would be like, the main difference being age. Ginger also explained in her best Jersey accent how Peaches would not be delicate like a flower, but would be willing to throw on some of the German maid's clothes to help with the disguise. Getting down to brass tacks, Josh uh, started talking multi-target penalties and decided to spend a possibility to make the spell come off just right. Obtaining a final roll of 16 just sufficient to make the changes desired for itself and its fellow knights. At which point, I whispered a note to Ginger and carried on with the changes Thuban had intended to make. One of them was to become Hildegard Marlin, or her likeness, the other into the likeness of Carl, the former scientific assistant to Dr. Marlin, now deceased. Ginger insisted on taking the time to do the spell and all to come after right, though she insisted they were still trying to get out during daylight, and this finally sparked a discussion the players had not done concerning, move, concerning movement to the seaplane hangar. Finding the pilot also, in accordance with Sharif's journal, took on new import as well. Now, with new clothes and a successful disguise spell cast, the knights decided to go find their pilot and, one way or another, get him to the seaplane. So you guys kind of step outside. One square equals three meters here. So just keep in mind that uh, uh, each of these squares is three meters. So your characters are not as large as, as what you're uh, getting here. Matter of fact, I'm going to make Thuban basically one like that. Thuban decided to leave the zombie behind, but for the sake of vision, I had to bring other tokens out. So I'm going to go ahead and bring out... I, I, Mo, I have put you on here so that you can see the map. Same thing with Dogfight. So um, I'm leaving them up in the upper right hand corner of the map so that you guys can see what's going on with it. Um, now what I need to do is make sure... Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Okay, so you guys are outside. 
and uh, there were some guards that did pass a few minutes ago. Uh, these guys over here, the runner and the sergeant here, um, look over and, and see you come out as the door closes. Now, all three of you are in your disguise, okay? Um, but it's not, it's not gonna take too much to see through it if you guys do something extraneous. Peaches whispered to disguised Chris and Thuban to, quote, look like you know what you're doing, not trying to look sneaky or acting weird, unquote. I had begun to perform more whispering this game session, being necessary to making the adventure more authentic, but it turned out to be an almost unnecessary pain in the butt instead. These notes went to Dogfight and Mo to prepare them for entry, or, in Mo's case, re-entry to the game. You guys get to move, but do it like one round at a time. Each of these squares is three meters, okay? So uh, look at your movement on your character sheet where you've got your move and your run. Uh, you're not running, so make sure that you take it in in three, in, uh, you know, every third one equals a square here. And if you move diagonally, it's just basically the same as moving a square laterally and then down or up or whatever, okay? It's, it's going to cost you two of those uh, movements. You've got your little ruler thing over here. I don't even know. It, it, when you look at your, your left-hand menu with all of your icons on it, you should have something that looks like a comb, okay? Uh, and when you go to take your... Uh, uh, your cursor over the top of that, I want you to select no snapping so the and then you can figure out how far you can move and and uh, the map is already set up to account for the number of meters that are there now if you go out a certain way and you're left clicking and hold to get your arrow down there and you want to go into various directions you would just hold up oh, let me let me get over here no snapping there we go okay you would just grab that and then you would right click and then you could bank off okay but don't release your left click, your left button until you're done with your movement. Understanding was signaled the table round. Then the knights decided to move with the slowest among their number. Don't forget, try and go from the center of your token uh, outwards, not from the edge. Okay. I know that's like old Battletech rules, but that's what it is. Peaches asked which way the guards were headed, toward or away from them. Um, they seem to be tending to the tower, and they do look away from you uh, after, a, after a few seconds. Thuban remarked the knights would casually continue on their way. Okay, so as you, as you move closer to buildings and stuff like that, you can kind of see what's going on. Now, um, so go ahead and, and keep measuring uh, your movement uh, actually, since you know that going diagonal, uh, you can only move the one diagonal space, or you can move two spaces otherwise, uh, you know, you should be, be good with that. Now, I, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not trying to do this for the sake of, of being fickle in, in how the cards play or anything like that. I, I'm trying to keep track of a lot of things at the same time. As the players traveled, Ginger asked what a certain building was. It looks like a corrugated tin uh, building. You know those uh, those uh, wrinkled buildings, the ones that uh, have the waves in them. Uh, it seems to be it's yeah. It seems to be almost a clamshell like that uh, for what you're seeing. But yeah, you see the eye of Horus up about midway the building. Um, there are windows if you will, kind of uh, cut into it uh, with, not plexiglass, uh, with real glass kind of sitting over them, um, but you can see nothing but drapes uh, over the, the fronts of those windows. Thuban sought clarification on the direction the hangar was in once again. The hangar, oh, the hangar is in this direction. My friends continued seeking clarification concerning items drawn on the map and about the purpose of the dogs and how they patrol. They patrol between two fences that run parallel to one another around the base. Ginger asked quite astutely, 
whether the dogs would see the knights as threats or allies. This is when I decided it was time to reveal the dogs. Let me get these guys moved where they're supposed to be. I wasn't going to introduce them just yet, but you see doggies. As the dogs inside the kennel fence were revealed, Thuban expressed it would be best to avoid them, and Peaches asked which way the wind was blowing. Let's see. Okay, it's coming from north to south. Immediately drawing a lament from Josh, while Peaches worried about their present positions and whether or not any of the dogs had taken notice yet. Okay. So you guys really haven't come around, well, I guess you have come around the corner of that barracks. Um, so some of the dogs do kind of sit up and take notice, but uh, in the heat that's going on right now, uh, and it is pretty hot here, uh, it's, it's more their tongues are wagging and whatnot. Um, they've got plenty of water in the area, so they're just mainly sitting around. Ginger remarked about continuing to remain calm while casually strolling by, remarking that the knights had their orders and were on a mission that must not fail, as if they belonged on the base and on mission, quote-unquote, straight from the pharaoh. All right, so you guys keep moving. The dogs continue to show some interest, but they at least recognize you visually. Some of them, however, kind of stick their nose in the air a little bit and kind of start to sniff. My knights continued asking questions as they moved about the map, but this time, mainly about the automobiles. No, these cars are not in motion. This one's parked. Um, uh, the one that was up here by Marlin's house was parked. Um, but there are some others that you begin to notice past the dog park. Um, let's see, do you? Yeah, there's one that's due south of where you guys are at right now. I'm going to go ahead and hit shift. There you go. That should have centered your screen. That's one that you can see. Um, but there are a bunch of buildings and stuff up here that are kind of in your way. What kind of car it is? Um, that is a Dusenberg. The question is, would Penny actually know that? Does, did Penny ever study cars? Uh, she has the drive skill. And... Yeah, but did Penny ever actually study cars? This would be a part of her background that you can kind of develop into it. As it turns out, Peaches was more of a long-range admirer of wheeled machines, especially the larger ones such as fire trucks and construction equipment. She did, however, explain her ability to use some basic appraisal skills that most everybody has, uh, and explaining the car seemed pretty pricey, asked if it might be an officer's vehicle. As far as you can tell, it probably would be. As a matter of fact, when you look to your right, uh, after looking at the car, you see that there's a name on the door. It says Colonel Abubakar Manatep. Josh asked if he'd always been named that, or if transformation had done it to him, bringing laughter all around. Peaches then asked if the colonel was anywhere to be found, or were the keys in the car? The answer to both questions being no. Thuban expressed surprise at having come as far as they had, though I reassured him that there really wasn't much to be able to detect in them since they had the disguise spell all over the three of them, and they had made some pretty decent moves. Then, in my attempts to bring Captain Mo Gonzalez, Rocket Ranger, into my game, or uh, uh, back into my game, Roll20 Chat and Discord both screwed me. So I. Mo, here's what I want you to do. I want you to switch over to the sidebar with me. Okay. 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 Uh, you, just about to suggest, to the side. you are coming in from the top left corner of the of the map, not the top left corner, but from the northeast of the map. You can have a, you have a direction finder at the top left of the map, next to the 
uh, uh, next to the card, the, the world laws card that I always put on the maps. Uh, and that shows the direction of north kind of pointing down and to the left. Um, okay, that's where that arrow points is north, and you're coming in kind of from the northeast. Okay, so look at the left hand side of the map, and you can. Okay, hang on just a second. Um, the turn order thing is a pain in the ass, too. Um, there's a, a very different one. Okay, um, anyway. Your um, your token, uh, I'm, I'm, your token is down. Okay, if you go to the very bottom, you've got it. Okay, place your token where you would like to come in. Now, before you do that, you've got you've got this right here, and this right here. Those are fences. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was asking about. Mm -hmm. Is that that classic Indiana Jones thing where, like, you know, rolled up under the trunk and, like, you know, was holding onto the undercarriage as I drove in so I could mm -hmm. get in and sneak in and look for the uh, mystery man? No. Or am I just, like, up in the hills, like, with a, uh, with a pair of binoculars, like, looking for something that looks like the stock game, but I just didn't watch mm -hmm. myself. Yeah, something like that. What I figure is that you were off in this direction. Do you see that arrow? Okay. You were off in that direction, and there are dunes out there, so you could do some spying and stuff like that. Um, there are not very many trucks that come in in a, particular, in a given day. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were two trucks that rolled out this morning, or, well, late this morning. So what you have is a guard tower uh, down here. If Oh, God. You have guard tower down this direction, okay? If you want to come in there, you have already spied a guard in there. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to go ahead and move him to the token layer, okay? All right. Um, okay, so I want you, you've got that guy, you've got this tank you could come in by, you've got this building over here. Um, if you come up in this area right about here, uh, uh, you're going to need a stealth check for both this guy down here and for these three guys and the dog over here. Okay, but what I'm hoping you'll do is that you'll kind of, uh, you know, like take this guy out, okay, and then kind of work your way up along the building because what I want to do is bring these guys in. Uh, they're over by Manotep's office right now, and I, I can center that for you. Hang on just a second, uh, and you can see their characters, okay? That should have centered the map for you. Um, and you're pretty sure your target is in this little building to the left of Chris's token. You do not see Peaches or Chris yet because they're behind this vehicle right I don't here. See them at all because they look like people. That's true. That is very, very true. Thank you. I Had not thought of that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, unless you've got something else for me, I'm going to move us both back up to the other channel. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to be coming in on this tower right here. Okay, and you're going to start a fight? And, and, I'm, and I'm going to start a fight. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to pull like, you know, pure blood rocket ranger. Uh huh. And, 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 and I'm, I'm probably going to take some, some strain and all that. And I'm just going to, like, you know, ram through that tower. 